the Atlanta Hawks tie with the Chicago Bulls and also lock in their playing spot, adding to that destiny of the Atlanta Hawks and the Chicago Bulls facing off in that first playing game. We're going to talk about that. Plus, we're going to talk about the Bulls' three-point shooting defense and how bad that is, thanks to an article from Real Gottlieb and Alice Caruso's chances to make an all-defensive first team. All that, plus the mailbag, right after this. You are now tuned in to Chicago Bulls Central, your number one place for all Chicago Bulls news and content. What's going on, Bulls fans? Welcome to another episode of Chicago Bulls Central, your number one spot for everything Chicago Bulls related. I'm the host there, Hayes, but more importantly, you guys can follow the channel at Bulls Central Pod on every social media platform we happen to be on. With that being said, let's go ahead and get into this content. So probably a fairly quick uh, episode today. Um, I want to talk about the Atlanta Hawks tying the Chicago Bulls. They got another win. Uh, Their magic number was also one to lock in the final playing spot. So now... That the, there still could be some seeding changes, right? But now the Eastern Conference play-ins are all locked. Uh, the, our playoff spots, postseason play-in, all that is everything's locked in. We know exactly who's going to be what, where. The Brooklyn Nets, the Toronto Raptors, Charlotte Hornets, Washington Wizards, and Detroit Pistons are all eliminated from even making the play-in. The Chicago Bulls and Atlanta Hawks are locked into at least the uh, at least uh, the play-in spots that they're in. Technically, they still could move up in seeding to either the eighth or the seventh seed via the number of games left, uh, but that's just not, uh, I think more of the 8 seed, but that's just poss- probably not going to happen. Also, the seeding's all going to change within the, you know, from uh, from seedings 2 through 6 as well. That all could be up in order, but we kind of now, we we now know who all is going to be in the postseason in the Eastern Conference, and so, you know, it, solid enough, right? I mean, cool enough, good, good enough for everybody there. Uh, when it comes down to it, though, the Atlanta Hawks and the Chicago Bulls are going to face off more than likely, unless something crazy happens, in that playing spot, uh, the Bulls and Hawks both have six games left. Um, so, you know, they're still fighting potentially over that ninth seed. And because the Chicago Bulls do hold the tiebreaker over the Atlanta Hawks, they would have to finish with a better overall record than the Chicago Bulls for them to move into the ninth seed. So the Bulls basically hold their own destiny in their hands as far as the ninth or tenth seeding um, in that Eastern Conference playing race for whatever that's worth. And you guys know how I feel about it. I, I feel like you know, this whole postseason thing for the Chicago Bulls, yes, it's postseason play technically, but I really look at it and I say this, um, what what for, right? And, you know, I know my video yesterday and saw a lot of your guys' comments like things like, well, we have to keep tomorrow. We have to do, like when you say things like that, all you're saying is that you're locking yourself into mediocrity. And so I don't think the Bulls have to do anything. It's, it comes down to what will they do though, right? And that's the question. And especially when you look at, Per what what DeMar DeRozan is probably going to get out in the free agent market if he does hit, I don't think the Bulls have to do anything when it comes to keeping him or Drum or anybody else because, unfortunately, and this is something that, you know, I didn't talk about in yesterday's episode because I left it really uh, Bulls-centric, is the fact that the Philadelphia 76ers have three players under contract for next year. Make no mistake about it. Every every free agent next year is going to be using the potential of, of going to the Philadelphia 76ers as leverage over their current team. Paul George is going to use it. DeMar DeRozan would be smart to use it. Every free agent next year is going to be using that. And I think that is legit leverage because when you only have three players under contract, if for some reason the Philadelphia 76ers do strike out, they are going to have to fill out a full roster and team, which means players like Bruce Brown, who's out there, right? I've made jokes before over on Player's Choice that it could end up in Bruce Brown. And, and DeMar DeRozan being their big uh, uh, offseason signings, I, I don't think that that's necessarily happening and true. But I'm just saying that that that's there. This is not the same situation where DeMar DeRozan came here. Keep in mind, we still offered more money than what was on the market then, too. And, you know, that really comes down to DeMar and his own personal, um, you know, what, what he wants. If it's the money, if it's truly to chase a ring, whatever that is. Uh, but, you know, that's a story for another day. We'll cover that when we get to it. The Bulls and the the Hawks are locked in now for their destiny. And one of the things that absolutely killed the Chicago Bulls in that last game against the Hawks was the Bulls' inability to guard the three-point line, which shout out to Will Gottlieb over at CHGO. He had a great article on the Bulls' three-point defense. I'm going to pull a couple of stats from that. First one saying that in the Bulls' wins, they shoot 38.4% from deep, while opponents shoot 32.8%. In the games that the Chicago Bulls have lost, they shot 33.9% from three-pointer, and their opponents have shot 40% from the field. The Bulls allow the second-highest corner three-point frequency 
to in the in the NBA. Now, part of that's due to our pick and roll defense. It's also how we defend uh, generally, but that is something that you have to look at, especially with potentially facing a team like the Atlanta Hawks in that play-in, or any team for that matter, right? We've seen teams that aren't really teams that you look at coming into those games as lock uh, or knockout three-point shooters, but they're because the Bulls give up that corner three so regularly, and that's one of the most efficient shots in the game of basketball. The Bulls get killed by it. And so, you know, I know this is kind of beating a dead horse when it comes to it now is the Bulls and their need for three-point shooters and and people who can stretch the floor. And, yes, I know Kobe White can shoot the three. He can hit it from far back. But he's not a shooter. He's a scorer. OB, you know, we'll see. We need to play him more right in how he develops over the rest of the season and offseason. I hope that he does get an opportunity, but we still need more shooting than that. That's not going to be enough to get us to league average, especially when we're giving up. The Bulls need to be focused on doing two things. That's shooting the three ball better with a higher rate on top of that, and then also guarding the three-point line better. And I would not be surprised at all that the Chicago Bulls go down due to a a flurry of threes in the playing tournament. That's just how this team is, right? And so especially when you look at the fact that we've lost more games than we win, that means that we're giving up 40% shooting in games that we lost from from three-point shoot. That's crazy. That's crazy. So the Bulls need to, to 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 fare better. That's just is what it is. The Bulls have to become a better three point shooting team. And I'm not even saying that to end this season or to play in. This season's kind of it's gone the way that it's gone, right? It is the way that it is. But the Bulls got things that they definitely need to work on, and hopefully this front office is looking at that in this off season to really try to change some things up. Some of that also is Vooch's defense, right? The fact that Vooch can only play in one style of defense. Those type of things definitely play a big part in that as well. There's a lot. That goes into why the Chicago Bulls give up the three-point shooting that they do. Um, the, like I said, the, the way that we run our defense is a big part of that. And, you know, Billy Donovan hasn't sh- shown an ability yet to do something different than that. But hopefully with a, you know, with whatever comes this offseason, maybe that can come along. I, I, you guys know how I feel about Billy Donovan. That's all I could say on that one. But let's go ahead and move into the last topic for today. And that's Alex Caruso and making an all-defensive first team. Um. Uh, Pat had had a great episode on it over on uh, Locked on Bulls. I was not on that episode last night. Pat held it down for us. And I think that when you look at Alice Caruso and the way that he impacts the Chicago Bulls defense, the, Alice Caruso has a, has a defensive plus minus at 3.5, which is the fourth highest in the NBA. Shout out to Elias Schuster on those stats. Uh, you know, he, he's only behind Jonathan Isaac, Isaiah Hardenstein, and Victor Winbayama in that in that case. Uh, and that's off dunks and threes. That's what the website that that came from. He's fifth in total steals this season and leads the NBA in deflections per game at 3.7. Alice Caruso defensively impacts the game, and then his offense has also come along for that huge leap for the Chicago Bulls. And so, you know, when you look at it and it comes down to it, we know what Alice Caruso has an impact in doing. But there also is, and I, and I didn't know this, I got to give credit to Elias on this one as well, that while Alice Caruso has met the game mark of 65 games to be eligible for postseason accolades, he's played 67 games. I did not know this. You, to be eligible, though, you uh, it, those 65 games must come with playing more than 20 minutes. And so he's only played 60 games that are over 20 minutes. So that's that's crazy to think of now. Games where he's played at least 15 minutes, two of those can be allocated. So 62 basically is where he's at. He needs three more games of being at least 20 minutes played to hit that. So let's hope Alice Caruso does, because it'd be crazy for Alice Caruso to be left off an all defensive first team because of uh, he didn't play a certain amount of minutes in some of those games. Like I can see the games play, but come on, NBA, you really put on an extra layer on that of minutes played. What are we talking about, bro? Like, like, yeah, I it's it's so crazy, man. I really do. I look at this thing so much, man. And, and the NBA just I I'm not I'm not a, a person who's against the 65 game rule at all. I think when you look at the history of most of these awards, most players play 65 games. So they basically just made something official that kind of was already happening in a lot of ways. That's why I haven't really complained a lot about the 65 game rule. But to say that those 65 games have to come in minutes over 20 minutes played, come on, bro. What a, like that's just that's just a weird weird thing for me. But you know, Alice Caruso and, and Kobe White are the two Bulls really well. And if we're, we're also looking at the Clutch Player Award, I, I talked about you know Demar, Kobe, and Io and, and the postseason accolades that they could be in line for. Demar Derozan in the Clutch Award, I think he's going to win that. Uh, Kobe White, the Most Improved Player Award, I think this recent slump has may, maybe has pushed him out of that uh, area and 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 you know has made the argument against him even louder. 
But Alex Caruso being on a first defensive team is something that absolutely needs to happen as well. Um, and, you know, we'll see what that plays off into the future for Alex Caruso with the Chicago Bulls. I know a lot of Bulls fans, even in my video yesterday, uh, you know, there was a mixed uh, bag between people in the comments that said we have to keep Caruso and we should trade Caruso uh, just to get some some assets back. So I know Bulls fans really differ on what Alex Caruso is for this team. Um, but, you know, he's he's been a huge part, and I would really love to see him be able to get into the uh, get uh, first defensive uh, team because he deserves it. But all right, let's go ahead and get into the voicemails we got for today. We got to the first one. This one's from Shay. What's up, Hayes? I'm going to make the short and sweet. Hey, look, I already know that the Bulls ain't going to let Billy Jonathan go anytime soon, but one thing I heard you say in the post game, this previous game against the Timberwolves, is that Billy Donovan needs a good offensive coordinator. And I think Mike D'Antoni would definitely do the job and definitely could help. Look, I'm not saying he's the end all be all, but I feel like he could be a very good offensive coach, especially with how we struggle to move without the basketball. He's an offensive wizard. That's why I think uh, that Houston Rockets team did so well and that, uh, and also that Phoenix Sun team in the past did really well. And then they were ahead of their time with how they were playing with small ball the way they're doing nowadays. I feel like if we hired Mike D'Antoni as our assistant coach, the Donovan hires Mike D'Antoni as his assistant coach to help him with that offense, it definitely could. You definitely could see a much more better offensive coordination. That's just my opinion. You might think something different. Anyway, so much to think. Peace. Mike D'Antoni as the bull. Like, first of all, bro, you just went to the first name that you knew. And, I, and I've said this before, and I, and I get it. We do that. I've done that sometimes. I don't want an, another name. I want you to go and find somebody. And I don't want to hear nothing about, well, they tried that with Fred Hoiberg. That doesn't mean you don't ever try it again. And that was a different front office. Going like going after the names, we stopped the search. Ime Doka was on our list, our short list. But then we went with the name in Billy Donovan, right? And so I, I, I don't want to see another big name coach. I don't want to see another recognizable name or face there. I want to see the Bulls actually do a search actually go in and conduct some interviews, actually go out and do their jobs and find somebody that has the potential to be the next great coach, whether that's just as an assistant or if that's somebody you're looking up as a succession plan to say, hey, this is a guy we're going to come in, bring to be our assistant. They're going to help Billy Donovan with either the offense or the defense. But guess what? We now have them in our organization. And guess what? We think that they could eventually turn into a head coach and we would love for that to eventually happen under a Chicago Bulls banner. That's the type of thing that I would want to see the Chicago Bulls do. Mike D'Antoni is a fine coach. Don't get me wrong. And I think he's done some really good job with some really good offenses over the course of his NBA career. You can't take away from that. But I don't I don't want Mike D'Antoni on Billy Donovan's staff. I want you to go and build out an actual staff with doing some research and finding some good names. That's what I want. would love the Chicago Bulls to do. Will they do it? No, I can't say that they will, right? That's, that's I'm, I'm not the one to make those decisions, but I don't, I don't want to see – a, 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 a bunch of former names and former head coaches that have all failed elsewhere coming to the Chicago Bulls. I want you to try to build something here. I want you to try to build something here, build something sustainable. You know what the Miami Heat did with Eric Spoelstra? He started off on their video team and worked his way up. And he's probably going to eventually be their next GM which whenever Pat Riley decides to go away and then a new head coach will take over. I want that here in Chicago. I want us to build a legacy at some point. Now, we have to win to do that, right? But I want us to start doing things like that. I don't want us to keep being the team that has to go after the big name head coaches to try to add some... I, I, I just don't like that. I just don't like it, man. I, and, you know, I think when you keep recycling the same names, you also recycle the same problems that happened on other teams. That's not necessarily what I want. But again, let me know what you guys think down below. Do you think Mike D'Antoni could be a good coach to come in, help evolve the Chicago Bulls offense? I doubt it would ever happen. I don't think he'll ever accept that job. But hey, let me know what you guys think down below. But all right, let's get into the next voicemail. This one's from TJ, not PJ, TJ. Yo, what's up, Hayes? It's TJ. Uh, first of all, I want to say appreciate you using my question as a part of the video. It's honestly, you know, I'm a big fan and shit, so it was good seeing it. It made me happy. Also. I would like to correct you on my name. It's actually TJ, not PJ. But let's get into it. So I know you was talking about Sonogo, and although I didn't mention him in my last uh, in my last voicemail, I do know about Sonogo, and I do watch some of his highlights and some of his films from the G League. But I was wondering, what can he work on this season as well so that he can actually get on the court? Because I would love to see him play, whether it be as the backup or – starting center. I just want to see him play. Honestly, I want to see him on the NBA court. I want to see what he can do 
see how much of his game could translate to the um to the higher level to the NBA and stuff. Um, some things that I feel like I want to see him work on is that jump shot. Like, yeah, he had it. He had the three ball when he was in college a little bit, but he kind of lost it when he got to the G D because he was like it was a little slow. I want to see him kind of speed up that jump shot. And even if he can't hit threes in, on the NBA level, I feel like even him being able to stretch the floor out in the mid range, kind of like what Vuj do, would be a big help to this team because they're kind of. I don't even know how to explain it, but I feel like that that helped a lot. Um, but yeah, again, appreciate you using me in the content and stuff. Appreciate it a lot, and hit me back. All right, uh, great thing on Sonogo there. Um, I've watched every every minute that he's played in the G League, and Sonogo definitely is. Uh, uh, he's a prospect, right? And you look at what he has done at the at the G League level. Even if he can bring seventy percent of that. That's a damn good, that's one of the better backup centers in the NBA. So we got to see if he's going to be able to do it. Now, where I disagree with you at is his jump shot. Like, yeah, I, I don't disagree that he needs to speed it up, but I don't think he needs a jump shot to be effective. When you look at Adama Sonogo and what he brings that he can hang his hat on right away if he is going to be playing for the actual Chicago Bulls next season is his shot blocking, his rebounding, getting steals, and his putbacks. That Like, Adama Sonogo needs to be a player to me that, that thrives off going after rebounds, and finishing on that, and pick and rolls, right? His jump shot, it is slow, and th and that's why I don't necessarily want to see that be something he tries to rely on too heavily at the NBA level because it is so slow, but he's improved. He's even he quickened it up uh, some at the G League level, but I just don't know if he's ever going to be a three-point shooter, and I know that's not what you said, but I don't, I don't know if he's ever going to be that at the NBA level just with how much time it takes him to get that shot off. Now, if he's wide open on switches, things like that, then yeah, but you know, so I think that that could be a thing. But as far as the jump shot, I would say this. If he can develop a reliable enough, like, 12-foot jump shot, 12- to 14-foot jump shot out, I think that that could be solid enough. And it's not something he has to go to enough, just something that he can do when defenses try to sag in or pack the paint on him. If he can do that to kind of keep them honest, I think you got a damn good player in Adama Sonogo as well. So, you know, we'll see. And I hope Sonogo definitely gets a chance heading into next season for the Chicago Bulls, a season where we could be right up against the luxury tax and to get players that, we have in our system that like was like Sonogo that was an undrafted free agent and that we can bring in. I think that could do wonders for uh, the Bulls team in depth and uh, for Sonogo. I think Sonogo has a lot of promise there. Like I said, specifically as a rebounder, shot blocker, he has a lot of that in him. And so, you know, I don't that won't shouldn't preclude the Chicago Bulls from, you know, drafting a big if, if, if uh, with the quality bigs that are in this upcoming draft. But I think Sonogo can definitely be a backup center for the future. And, uh, yeah, you can do a lot worse than that. But, guys, let me know what you guys think. That's today's show. Make sure you guys are following the show at Bulls Central Pod. You can send us any feedback, questions, comments, concerns. BullsCentralPod at gmail.com. Lastly, if you want to leave a text message and our voicemail for the mailbag, the number to do so, 773-270-2799. We are the number one spot for everything Chicago Bulls related. Thanks to you guys. And like I like to end every episode on, go Bulls. Love you guys. See red if you can, y'all. Peace. This has been a presentation of the Break Break Media. Break.